Sir George Galloway. I heard such tosh, Mr. Speaker. This House of Commons continued its adversarial, bare pit, unarmed political combat throughout the darkest days of the Second World War. Mr. Churchill didn't ask for Parliament to be silenced, for confrontations across the House to be forbidden when our soldiers were being laid waste in the Norway debate. The House of Commons rose perhaps to its finest 20th century moment. Nobody said our armed forces have suffered a disaster. The House of Commons cannot meet. The clash of ideas cannot be heard. We must muffle the drums and silence ourselves. At Dunkirk, the House clashed without pause. Real war leaders like Mr. Churchill understood that the whole point of us being here, the whole point of democracy, the whole point of elections is that we do not suspend normal political activity. Happily. I have a lot to say and I may take some time to say it. I'm very grateful to the Honourable Gentleman. He's missed the rather important point that between 1939 and 1945, general elections were suspended. So democracy was suspended during the war and his history is faulty. Actually, there were many by-elections, some of them producing spectacular results, as spectacular as the one in Bradford West just over a year ago. But in any case, is anyone suggesting that an Iron Bevan didn't stand on these benches lacerating real war leaders about their conduct of the war? The Honourable Gentleman is a scholar and a gentleman. He knows very well the words of Mr Amory from his side. At that darkest hour in the Norway debate, which brought about the defenestration of the Prime Minister and the coming to office of Mr Churchill, about whom more, much more later. We did not suspend our democracy in our darkest hours. Why are we suspending it now? It was said from one of the ironclad consensus on the front benches that this was a national funeral. I'm sorry, but it is not a national funeral. You can only have a national funeral where there is a national consensus about the person being buried. And that consensus does not exist in relation to Mrs Thatcher. And no matter how oft people from the front benches fawn upon her, pour honeyed words upon her, even outside of this house, of course, tell lies about her and her record, that won't change. And the British establishment is making a profound misjudgment here. In a, and the opposition parties, in particular, are making a profound misjudgment. If they imagine that there are not tens of millions of people in the country, all of whom have votes, who are very angry about a whole range of issues that have arisen. And I hope to adumbrate some of them in relation to this motion this evening, Mr Speaker, with your permission. If I was to speak shortly, it would be that great New York phrase, enough already. We've had enough of this. It's gone on too long and it's gone too far. And this puts the tin hat on it. The idea that we should suspend a vital part of our democratic process for a party political and private funeral. Don't get me wrong, I won't be demonstrating at the funeral tomorrow. I believe it's wrong to demonstrate at someone's <laughs> funeral. But I will not agree to suspend our democracy so that some of the friends of the deceased 
have to make a choice between attending Prime Minister's question time or going to the funeral. And that's a choice that's up to them to make. And of course, it's very clear that they could do both, though they would have tender sensibilities, though they may have, to come into the bear pit immediately on their return to the House. But then that's what they're here for. That's what they were elected to be here for. Harold Wilson, who won four general elections and didn't receive a scintilla of the treatment which the British establishment has rolled out for the deceased on this occasion, said that a week was a long time in politics. And this week has been a very long time. We were told at the beginning of the week that it was disrespectful to speak of someone so recently dead. I was told on the BBC yesterday I should hold my peace until Thursday. How much national mourning without consensus and without justification are we supposed to observe? You know, Mr. Speaker, how much personal respect I have for you. And so I hope you will accept from me that I mean nothing personal in this point at all. But the decision to muffle Big Ben just after the BBC had muffled Ding Dong <laughs> summed the whole thing up. It has become farcical. There is no national consensus around the deceased. There was no justification for muffling Big Ben because that puts the deceased on a par with Mr. Churchill, a very divisive politician. My grandparents helped overturn his car after the count in Dundee in the 1930s when he was thrown out of parliament in the city. He vowed, I will, I will. I wish to correct the gentleman, Winston Churchill, uh, then a Liberal MP, was ejected from Dundee in 1922. He served from 1908 to 1922. Well, it, it, it's, a very, it's a very important qualification. He was... Which, the Honourable Gentleman to be led away from the path of virtue, that the point may be of interest to scholars, but it is at best tangential to the sittings of the House motion. Mr George Galloway. As would have been what I was going to say about Neddy Scrimger, the great temperance MP, a man who's, who was Mr Churchill's partner in the two constituency, a two-member constituency at that time how we could do with some temperance in the House today, some prohibition uh, in the House today, at least so far as the Honourable Gentleman for Falkirk is concerned. The I do ask the Honourable Gentleman, I know he's developing his argument, if he would be good enough to withdraw the reference to an Honourable Member who's not present and to continue with his main speech. I uh, withdraw it. It was unworthy. But I do have some history with the Honourable Gentleman and I uh, hope you'll forgive me and the House will forgive me for that unworthy detour down Dundee way. Uh, but my point is that Mr Churchill was a deeply divisive figure, a man who changed uh, sides, ratted, re-ratted, a man who was in Parliament, out of it, back again, a man whose conduct of public affairs was very, very controversial and divisive. But by the time he died, a tiny percentage of the population were churlish enough to imagine that such a man should not be given the full 21-gun treatment, the full gun carriage treatment. Because virtually everybody in this country knows that if it were not for Mr Churchill, either this parliament would not exist or it might be speaking in German. The very existence of the country, I argue, 
was saved by Mr. Churchill. That makes him worthy of a national funeral. That's what made him, whatever one's point of view about his domestic politics, deserving of the muffling of the chimes of Big Ben, deserving of the cranes being lowered on the Thames. No such consensus exists. You must know this, Mr. Speaker, about the deceased in this case. In vast tracts of this land, the North, Scotland, the Midlands, South Wales, the industrial areas of this country that were reduced to distressed areas in Mrs. Thatcher's term of office have never forgiven her, but they're being asked to pay for this funeral. In fact, they're not being asked. They're being told that they must pay for this funeral. Now, the deceased was a great proponent of private enterprise and a great enemy of public expenditure and the role of the state which she wished to shrink. You were once a devotee of these things yourself, Mr. Speaker, but I think uh, age has brought wisdom in some <laughs> respects to all of us. But it is, an, it, 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 is, it is an irony, is it not? It is an, I mean, as Ken Loach, the great film director, put it, Surely we should have put this funeral out to tender to the private sector and invited companies to sponsor it. It's what she would have wanted, surely. It's what she would have wanted. At a time when our pensioners are shivering to death, literally, in a long winter that stretched now into the spring, at a time where we're virtually nationally bankrupt, is it right that the public should be told not asked, but told that they must pay for a party political funeral. I believe not. And the public have not been consulted about any of this. And if my post bag has any relationship to anyone else's, it must be obvious that a lot of people are very unhappy about the... Dis and of course, they did have one chance. Mr. Speaker, I alluded to it a moment or two ago. They could download Ding Dong, the song from The Wizard of Oz, and they did in very large numbers. And the state broadcaster, which has led the phoning, actually censored the music that the public, with their money, in a decision, a private economic decision that they made, Mrs. Thatcher was a big fan of those, private economic decision that they made to buy a single was then censored by the state broadcaster. Order, I was just awaiting the conclusion of the honourable gentleman's sentence, but I struggle to see how what he has just said relates to the terms of the motion, the sittings of the House motion, to which I know it was his intention, and is now his intention, immediately to return. Mr George Galloway. Indeed, sir. Of course, the, the backdrop to this cannot be separated from it. There are many people watching this on the Parliament Channel who know what the backdrop to this... Well, well uh, honourable gentlemen may... Honourable gentlemen may... Honourable gentlemen may laugh, but that's because they're not used to being watched on the Parliament Channel. Let me... Let me... Let me assure them... Let, let, perhaps... Perhaps just as well... Perhaps... The, they can't silence me, Mr. Speaker. Some, some members are not for turning, and I am one of them. And better men than those have tried to do so. I'm going to be, I'm going to be cognizant, but when I'm here, people listen. Unlike, unlike, unlike some, well, I have a lot of tweets about the speeches that preceded, that preceded this one, Mr. Speaker. They're not at all complimentary, uh, let me assure you. My point is this, that the backdrop, the, backdrop, the backdrop to this is clear, and it's been one thing after another. As Mr. Macmillan said, it's not one damn thing. It's one damn thing after another. It's the state mourning that was effectively declared by the state broadcaster. It's the decision that the government made, I understand, 
It's even speculated that your office was not wild about the idea to recall Parliament at a vast public expense, offering members of Parliament up to £3,700 to fly back from their holidays to attend what was in effect a state eulogy for a party political figure, then fly back at public expense to their holidays. And I hope that IPSA will be releasing the figures of who claimed and what they claimed. This was a grotesque decision, totally unnecessary. Monday was the day when Parliament returned. Monday was the day when people could have made their tributes and uh, paid their tributes and made the points that they wished to make. That was the second problem. The state mourning, the first, the recall, unnecessary recall, fantastically expensive recall of Parliament was the second. The muffling of the chimes of Big Ben was the third. The banning of Ding Dong was the fourth. And now we have this. Now we have this. The shadow leader of the House, rather politely, as is her wont, made the point that there's every belief in this House that this Prime Minister likes to avoid Prime Minister's question time. If he avoids it tomorrow, he will have avoided it for four weeks, four consecutive weeks. Now, I, I'm at every Prime Minister's question, so look, look, the, the honourable gentlemen, I must call them, opposite, I caution them again. People are listening to this debate and cackling like hyenas, this Thatcherite chorus over there would be better would be better to show just a touch of sensitivity to the fact that there are millions of people in this country hate Margaret Thatcher and those who followed her and the Prime Minister if he dodges Prime Minister's questions tomorrow will have dodged them for four consecutive weeks. Now, as Mr. Wilson said, a week's a long time in politics. Four weeks is a long time to miss Prime Minister's question, the only mass audience. I'd much prefer to give way to the Honourable Gentleman than for him to cackle and wobble his ample girth from a sedentary position. I'd much prefer to give way to him. Mr. Jacob rees -Mogg. if you would rule whether such terms of phrase are parliamentary. Yeah. The short answer to the Honourable Gentleman is that what has just been said was distasteful, but it was not disorderly. It does not seem to have evoked any great display of misery on the part of the Honourable Gentleman, but I know that the Honourable Member for Bradford West, when he comes to speak, will do so with a degree of calm and measurement of words for which I know in future years he will want, of course, to be renowned. Mr Alex Shelbrook. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and there was I under the impression that the Honourable Gentleman was a great orator. I'm sure the Honourable Gentleman, in, in context to his last comments, will agree and, and congratulate this Prime Minister for making sure that Parliament isn't gone for four months and indeed bringing the House back in September so that he can do those two sessions of Prime Minister's questions, which up until recently um, just didn't happen. That's, that's actually the best point that the Honourable Gentleman has made all evening. It just goes to show that points, that points made from one's feet are usually better than points made from a sedentary, indeed relaxed, position. It is a fair point that Parliament does not retire for the summer for as long as it did in our long period together, Mr Speaker, in the House of Commons. But facts are chills that win a ding, as we say in Scotland. Every Wednesday, the Prime Minister should stand at the dispatch box and face the music of everything that's happened in the previous week. And for four weeks, it will have been the case that the Prime Minister has not done so. At a time when the British economy is in desperate trouble, the Prime Minister has not been able 
to be questioned about it. At a time when a budget has come and gone, which has been near universally regarded, welcomed, my goodness, I don't know where it was welcomed, certainly not by the financial commentators, certainly not by the markets, certainly not by the public, certainly not by the opinion polls, but the Prime Minister has not been able to be questioned about it. The Prime Minister has not been able to be questioned about anything for four weeks, neither domestic nor international, and our country is involved in very many, and you'll be very happy that I don't seek to dilate upon them, Mr. Speaker, but the country is involved in some very serious matters overseas also, and the Prime Minister has not been able to be questioned about them. And I just feel, and I think that the attendance here this evening indicates that there are many who feel whether they're on the official opposition or not, there are many who feel that this has all gone too far. That an attempt at canonization of a person around whom there is... I see the speaker is frowning. I speak as a religious man. I'm not uh, against canonization where it's justified. But there has to be a consensus before one can be canonized. And no such canonization is possible. From the backbenches, which I think is rather unseemly, and members can't both cavil at what's being said and then make a raucous noise themselves. I simply say to the honourable gentleman, member for Bradford West, that I wasn't frowning at him, I was listening attentively to him. Mr George Galloway. Thank you, sir. The point is that beatification, canonization, is something that can only happen when there is a consensus. There is no such consensus about the former Prime Minister. Yet people are acting, the state is acting, and the state broadcaster, and now the parliamentary authorities are asking us to accept things which are too close to royal. You see, Mrs Thatcher famously had a slightly fraught relationship with the palace, and I can understand why. Mrs Thatcher may to many of the honourable gentlemen opposite have been great, but she was not to up to 60% of the electorate when she was alive, and according to the polls, more than 50% of the people now being polled are against her, were strongly against her, feel that she did bad things here and abroad. And it brings into discredit this kind of funeral, this kind of state occasion, if it's awarded in a way which many people in the country feel is unjustified and feel is being rammed down their throats for partisan reasons and ideological reasons and for which they're being asked to pay. And I caution, through you, Mr. Speaker, the establishment of which I suspect you're not fully regarded as a member, though you ought to be, because your office is one of the great offices in the land. But I, I say through you to this establishment that, 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 that you've gone too far. They have gone too far. There's been too much of this. It's too expensive. It's too elaborate. It's too regal. And many, many people in the country are unhappy about it. And I just feel that to compound all that I've tried to say, to compound it with effectively cancelling a vital part of British political life would be to compound, to add insult to the injury already suffered. My last point... <laughs> Gentlemen and ladies, and ladies. <laughs> although the, the, mis, the misbehaviour is coming exclusively from, I think they're called gentlemen, uh, opposite. My, my point is this, Mr Speaker, this funeral did not have to be organised so that it would clash with Prime Minister's question time. It could have been held today, it could have been held on Thursday. 
It could have been held later on Tuesday. The state was vitally involved in the organization of this funeral. We know that because we're paying for it. The state was vitally involved in the organization of it and it was them who organized a clash with Prime Minister's question. So why should the House of Commons be asked to accept the abrogation of its proper role tomorrow when the government is responsible for bringing about any clash insofar as there is one. But it's too late now to change the time of the funeral. It's not too late for the House to refuse to abandon its responsibilities at Prime Minister's questions. And I hope, if the House divides at the end of the evening on this, as I hope it will, that a decent number of Members of Parliament will reflect the feelings of, if not their own constituents, then the tens of millions of constituents of many of us here, and some of them there, who feel that the adoration of the Maggie has gone far enough.